good stuff. But overall, New Zealand was becoming more and more non-Christian or anti-Christian. And I wanted to see the good news spread right across the nation. And so I was searching and looking everywhere, seeing people all over the world, literally, trying to find out where it was that people were seeing God move, where they were seeing people's lives changed in great numbers and in a way that was affecting communities, affecting nations even. And that's where I first came across um, the whole idea of church planting movements, uh, David Garrison's book, some of you may have read it. And from there, I started tracking down that sort of stuff. And I was doing that and then being called up to be the pastor at Terry Carey Baptist. And I started up there experimenting just on some of the stuff I was learning about how to make disciples who make disciples. I was full-time pastor there for four years, and then I went half-time so I could spend the other half round the far north working in small groups, seeing if I could actually get out there and make disciples who would then turn around and make disciples who would then turn around and make disciples. I wanted to see how to multiply things. I mean, I've done it for years, but it's always been slow. You know, someone gets saved and a year or so later, they start to be effective in the field. And a year or so later, their people start, you know, and we've got folk who've discipled, you know, over the years all over the place. But it was really slow and it wasn't even, you know, at a rate that would have kept up with the birth rate if everybody in New Zealand who was Christian were doing it. So I'm going, Lord, we want more. So when I first decided, OK, we'll do this, God, so, um, very sort of a, in a very roundabout way that only God could organize. I put me in contact with the Mary Farnell up in the far north in a place called Mauriwa, about 20 minutes south of Kirikiri where I was. And I started in there doing Bible studies in their home. And I just saw that start to take off to the point that my first contact person, Amy, in that situation, 18 months later, she said to me, you know, Brian, since I decided to follow Jesus, I've seen 15 of my whanau come to the Lord, and I've had the joy of baptizing four of them. And that was sort of, at that point, I went, yeah, it's starting to work. So we've seen disciples make disciples make disciples down to the fourth generation, and we've seen groups form that formed other groups that formed other groups down to the third generation. Now, those numbers have probably got bigger since then, but I'm not in the far north now. I've shifted back to Caddy Caddy, and I'm not in as close a touch with some of the things that are going on down there. In some ways, when movements happen, you never are. You know, I had the sort of scenes where if someone would ring me up and say, Brian, just so you know, I'm off to baptize Christine. She came to the Lord yesterday. Or, Brian, um, have a look of this. Is my wife showing me a Facebook set of photos of some baptisms happening with someone that was one of my leaders. And I didn't know it was happening. And they were just out there doing the work. It was happening. So... That was one of the lessons I learned very, very early on. If you want to control it, you won't see movement. Mm. If you're prepared to let the spirit loose and do things and not want to have your hands on everything, then people are out there free to get on with it. So I saw that sort of stuff happening. I saw it happening not only with Mary Fano, but with middle class Pakihas. I've seen it working not only with me, but in the last couple of years up there, um, I started doing some training with other churches and I saw them pick it up and take it and see results come out of it. So I started to sort of go, okay, it's it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger. And in our situation in Kirikiri, we had the work with the Baptist church. We also had a very strong work with folk coming down to Kirikiri from Vanuatu to work in the kiwi fruit work and blueberries and all that there. So we'd taken trips up to Vanuatu and my wife's been up there 11 times. I've been up there 10 times and doing a lot of work with them down here, doing Bible studies and leadership training. And we had the small group work we were doing. So we got to the point where all those things weren't going to fit in one life. So we decided it was you know, time to focus more. So as my wife put it, being sensible, we gave up the paid job and retired from the Baptist church. And then um, when we did that, um, Monica Clark, who's Director of Church Army in New Zealand, came to me and said, hey, will you do some training for us? So that's where I started doing some training for Church Army, along with all the other things I'm doing. So I'm connected with a lot of folk. We've just recently, about three weeks ago, come back from spending seven weeks traveling around New Zealand, doing trainings. We're seven weeks away, five different trainings um, a Saturday full-day training is what I'm talking about there, five trainings in five different churches, five different denominations. So 
we've seen a, a broad spectrum of what God is doing across the nation. We've been in churches like Grace Vineyard down in Christchurch, which is a six campus, very large church, or the street in Wellington, which is a very large brethren church. We've done training in both of them, and we've done training in small Anglican and Presbyterian churches. Wherever God leads us, that's what we've been doing over the last time, as well as just down the road from us, there's a small subdivision. We're out in the country, but there's a subdivision based around a golf course, so that's our primary target for our own personal evangelism. So we came back to Caddy Caddy in December, and since then we've made contact, got names, addresses, and starting to our work on getting into the, the folk in the subdivision. Now if I pull out my phone and tap Fairview, which is the name of the subdivision, we've got about 30 folk there that we've started to build connections with and form relationships with. So that's a, a rough description of what I'm up to at the moment. And in the process of doing that, there was a lot of things that I had to unlearn so I could learn them and do them differently. And one of them was the way we make disciples because the Western church has made disciple making quite complicated and they've made it a matter of knowledge, transferring knowledge from my head to your head. And we're focused on teaching people stuff. But when you look at it biblically, we're commanded and to teach them to obey, not just to know, but to obey. And so I had to learn how to make discipleship be based on obedience rather than just teaching knowledge. You know, I love teaching knowledge. I'm a teacher by background, so I like doing it. But it's a different deal when you're trying to teach people to actually put things in practice week by week by week. And that's where the Discovery Bible Study approach um, that I picked up from folk overseas comes in because it's... Um, if you do it right, it's geared towards teaching people not only to know stuff, but to get out and practice it. One of the other things I came across was if you want things to multiply, you have to make them simple. When I was doing discipleship in the past, I'd disciple someone with all the skills and abilities I've got, all the techniques, all the gifts, but they weren't me, so they couldn't turn around and do that. But I wanted to learn how to disciple people in a way that they could take the same stuff turn around and do it themselves. And I saw that happen. In fact, the first group I started with, a group of non-Christian folk, very interested, had seen miracles happen, so they were interested in God. Two weeks in, I looked at the husband and said, this is pretty easy, isn't it? And he said, yeah. And I said, you could do this with your friends, couldn't you? And he said, yeah. So in two weeks, I had a non-Christian guy who figured he could run a Bible study. And he was right. A few weeks later, him and his wife were. So we're looking at simple ways of doing things that anyone can take. doesn't matter who they are. And part of that emphasis was to shift away from a very strong emphasis on print and material and move to a more oral approach. So all the stuff that I do in terms of the initial evangelism in groups and the discipleship follow on from there is story-based. So I started out working and we've got a set of seven stories that I've labeled Getting to Know Jesus. And it's designed for non-Christians to sit down and learn about Jesus in a very oral fashion, in a way where they are challenged to work out what the Word of God is saying for themselves, what it's saying to themselves, and what it means in terms of what they're going to do that week. So that's the emphasis. Um, so what I'm being asked to do tonight is just show you the middle bit of what we do in the meeting, the actual Bible study part, because we do a bit at the start, which is the looking back, how did you get on, putting into practice what you're talking about, what God been doing in your life. We do the Bible study bit in the middle, and then we do that, what are you going to do? And I'll do a little bit of that tonight. But So basically, I'm going to do that middle bit. So here we go. Let me tell you a story. See... There was one day that Jesus was talking to a group of people and they thought they were right with God. They were sure of that. And they looked down on everybody else. And so Jesus told them this story. He said there were two men that went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a tax collector. Now the Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed to God and he said, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. 
I'm not a robber. I don't do evil things. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like that tax collector over there. I fast twice a week. I give a tithe of everything I get. But the tax collector, he stood further back and he didn't even look up to heaven. He just beat on his chest, put his hand to his heart and he said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus looked at the guys and he said to them, that man went home accepted by God, but not the first man. Because he who lifts himself up will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be lifted up. All right, so that's the story from God's word. Now, I want to read it to you. You'll find it in Luke chapter 18 and starting at verse 9. So, I want you to listen carefully because you're going to tell the story back to me after. So, I'm reading it in a very easy read version of the Bible that I find works very well with non Christians. Jesus told a story to some people who were sure they were right with God. They looked down on everyone else. He said to them, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, he said. I'm not like robbers or those who do other evil things. I'm not like those who commit adultery. I'm not even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood farther away than the Pharisee. He would not even look up to heaven. He brought his hand to his heart and prayed. He said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I tell you, the tax collector went home accepted by God but not the Pharisee. All those who lift themselves up will be made humble, and those who make themselves humble will be lifted up. Right, now I want you to turn off your Bibles or close them, whether you're physical or digital, so you don't have them in front of you. And I want you to tell me the story. So let's start. Who was Jesus talking to? You'll have to unmute yourself. Who is Jesus talking to? Just an ordinary group of people. Right? And what, what did we learn about those people? What did the Bible say about them? Uh, Jesus was telling uh, to the people, those who act like they are righteous. Right. They thought they were righteous. What did they think of other people? They thought everyone else was a sinner and they were the good ones. Right. They looked down on them. That's what that says. So, okay. So what did Jesus do when he's talking to these people? Once again. What did Jesus do when he was talking to those people? He told them a story. Right. Yeah. Mm. Right. Terrible. Yeah. Yep. So, then what was the story? How does it start? Story about two people uh, and how they pray and right. what is in their mind while they pray. Okay. So, who was the two people? What, was, what were they? Best one were the good people, the Jews who, who prayed. Uh, according to their righteousness. Yep. So, what did the, what was the first guy? He came from a particular group. They called him a what? Uh, he was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, and the other guy was a. Tax collector. Right. And so, what did the Pharisee pray? He was. He was paying. Like the, he was telling, like you know, he was paying the tithes, and he used to do all what the law. Uh, what is written in the law. 
right? What else did he say? He talked about things he did, but he also talked about things he didn't do. So what did he say there? For those, I oh know. He compared himself to um, the text collector and said, I'm not like him. I'm right? better than so him. And he pointed out all his righteousness. Right. So he talked about all the good things he did. What were the good things he mentioned? Giving tithes. He tithed. Fast. He fasted. What did he say he didn't do? He wasn't a adulterer or yep, wasn't an adulterer, he wasn't a sinner. He wasn't a sinner. Yeah. He didn't rob people, he didn't do evil things. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. where did the story go after we had his career? What was next in the story? With the tax collector praying. Yes, and what did the tax collector say when he prayed? And what did he do? He accepted that he's a sinner. Yeah. And asked God to have mercy upon him. Right. Have mercy on me, I'm a sinner, yeah. And what about sort of body language? What was he doing? Where did he pray? He was uh, beating upon his chest. Right. Yes. Head bowed, he was not looking up to the heaven, but he head bowed. Right. Okay, and then what did Jesus say after he talked, to, sort of described the tax collector's prayer? What did he say? There are some people there, actually. If you got your mics uh, mute, can you please unmute so you can participate as well? Sorry, Brian. To, um... No, no, that's fine. I'm watching that myself. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So what, what, what did Jesus say at the end of all this after he told the story? Can you remember? He asked them yeah. a question. He asked a question and asked them who got accepted in God's uh, God's eyes. Yeah, I'm not sure that he asked a question. I think he said it. He, he said, said one who will be who hum humble themselves will be exalted. Exactly. Yep. He who lifts himself up will be abased. Humble. And those who humble themselves will be lifted up. There's one other bit that he, yeah. one other bit he said about who was accepted or who was righteous with God. Who was it that he said went home righteous? Tax collector. Right, the tax collector. Okay, so that's the story. Now, get your Bibles again. So for those who have just arrived, we're at Luke 18, verse 9, looking at the story Jesus told of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying. what version are you using are you using a message or no i'm actually using what's called the nirv basically it's the new international version but they took some steps to lower the reading age down so where there was a long sentence they've chopped it into two or three sentences oh, okay. and where there was a big word that people wouldn't understand they've turned it into maybe a couple of words Good example of what they do where it's talking in Galatians about, you know, the human nature, the works of the flesh. The NIV uses the word debauchery. Right. Now, not many people know what the word debauchery means. In the NIRV, they use wild living. And most of the people I were dealing with, they know about wild living. Yeah. So that's what it is. And I, I use that quite deliberately because I found that for a lot of people, reading is not their favorite occupation yeah. it's not something they do a lot of and so i wanted to use a version of the bible that i would could trust but it was a version that would be easy to read so it's the new international readers version yeah. it's often the one you'll find in um its bibles um, it's got the lowest reading age i could find of any actual proper translation the next level up would be the um, contemporary English version, and the next level up after that would be the New Living Translation. So, but very deliberately. And when you find people who will happily take it because they understand it, um, then you get it. When I started Bible study with a group of non-Christians, I had a trust who would provide me with all the Bibles I needed, and I would actually give every person in the study 
one of these Bibles, just a cheap paperback version, newsprint sort of pages, nothing fancy. Yeah. But it meant that when we were doing the Bible study, I'd say, okay, turn to page such and such. They didn't have to know how to find Luke 14, 18, whatever it was or anything like that. I could just refer to it by page number and then point and say, we're starting here. You know, just below the big 18, down there with the little niners, okay? And we're away. And that meant that everybody is on the same page. Likewise, when we do the Bible studies, we only look at the scripture we're looking at. So I instruct Christians beforehand, don't hop around and go from Genesis to Revelation. Stick to the story because that means everybody's on a level playing field. You know, if you've got non-Christians that you are trying to help them get to know Jesus, you don't want to have them having to hop about everywhere. You just want everybody sticking to the same story, same thing. And so that's what we do. So like we've shown so far, I tell the story, then we read the story, and then we try and rebuild the story together as a group. Now, that means that people have heard it basically three times before you start to actually get into the story. One of the pastor's wives I trained up to do this, she had a guy in her first group who could not read at all. And he was absolutely wrapped because for the first time in his life, he could be part of a Bible study. Because by the time he had heard the story three times, he knew the story. And the way we do the learning bit meant that he didn't have to read at all. And you'll find that when you're working with non-Christians to whom the Bible is a foreign book, doing it in that very oral fashion makes a huge difference. It also means people can turn around and do it themselves fairly quickly. And I encourage people, some people say, oh, I can't remember all that. I said, don't bother to remembering all the details. Just remember it as a story. Tell it as a story. When you read it, that'll sort out anything you missed out or didn't get quite right. The actual reading of the word means they get it straight. So after we've done all this bit that we've done, then we go into, okay, what can we learn about this? So let's start with the story and let's start looking at it. What do we know about the people that Jesus was talking to? Look at your Bibles. What does it say? How does it describe them? He told the story to people who, what? Great confidence. Sorry? We were at great confidence in the own oh. business. They were, right. confident in the, they were confident in themselves. Yep, they were confident in their righteousness. Yep. And, and what else does it others. say? And they right. despised others. Right. Now, have you ever met people like that? <laughs> mm. All the time. Yeah. 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 They're not uncommon, are they? No. People who think Very they've cool. got the market on God and no one else has got it, you know, and they look down on people. So that's who Jesus was talking to, that sort of person. And we know them. We've met them. Now, what did he do? I mean, in our situation, a lot of us want to teach them a bit of doctrine and straighten them out about how they know better than anybody else. And, you know, they're a sinner just like everybody else. And, you know, I mean, Jesus let rip at the Pharisees at times and he told them straight. He didn't. He told them a story. Now, why do you think he told a story? Because they will remember a story better. Okay, it helps them to remember it. And as yep. more, you can explain a story better than just saying being straightforward with something. Right. Okay, anyone else with ideas? You realize there's no right answers to some of these. He tried to create a picture. Uh, so that uh, they could picture it in their mind, what he really was talking about. Right, yes. Yeah. Anyone else? Some of the ones who just look like blank screens to me, want to contribute? Huh? He was um, allowing them to come to their own conclusions. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't um, telling them what to think, but he was allowing them to come up, come up with their own conclusions. Right, right. They were going to come up with their ideas out of what he told them. 
I, I, I reckon Jesus used stories so much because they sneak up on people. Mm. You know, they're going along with a story, going along with a story, and then all of a sudden they go, oh, okay, and they get the point of what Jesus was saying. So let's have a look at this story. We've got Pharisee and tax collector. Now, just a point of training, when I'm doing this story with non-Christians, before I start, I explain what a Pharisee is and a tax collector is. So right at the beginning, when I'm about to tell the story, I say there are two people in this story that you might not recognize them, that one's a Pharisee, they're the real super religious dudes who had all these rules and they figured they knew how to sort of do it right for God. They had a big long list of what you had to do. And then there were the tax collectors. Now, no one likes tax collectors anyways, but these guys were collecting it for the Romans. So they were traitors, they were collecting money to give to the enemy, etc. Nobody liked them, they were despised. And then I tell the story. So you do the explanation of the Pharisee and the tax collector right up front, because then when you tell the story, you don't have to interrupt the story with an explanation. And then on you go. Obviously, with a bunch of Christians, I don't have to do that explanation. So we do that. And we get there and say, okay, we've got this story. Let's have a look at the story. First, we've got this Pharisee. Now, remember, he's the super religious dude. He's the one who thinks he's got it right with God. Now, let's have a look at his prayer. How does he pray? What stands out when you look at his prayer? What do you sort of notice? Pride. Yep. Self -righteous. Self -righteous. I, 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 and I. Yep, yep. Very focused on himself. Yep, yeah. anything else? Self-righteousness. Oh, yeah, yeah, hey. I've got it together. Religious. Yep. Very religious man. What about his attitude towards other people? Very bad. Definitely yeah. he look down on others because he yeah. says, I'm not like them. Yeah. You, know? you can almost imagine him going, you know, you know, God, God, I'm not like yeah. him. Yeah. You know, that very much pointing down, looking down on the tax collector guy, etc. Yeah. Now, have a think. The people Jesus were talking to were in that same pattern of thinking, that same mold. What would they be thinking when they heard that prayer? Would they recognize it? Yeah. Of course. No. Would it sound familiar to them? Mm -hmm. You know, the sort of prayer, oh, yeah, good prayer, yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. Mm. Would that be the reactor? Because that's what we're looking at. They hear Jesus describe this guy's prayer, and because of we know from their description, they think they're righteous, and they look down on others, they began, yeah, yeah, yep, good prayer, Pharisee, I'm with you. And then the tax collector praying. What would these guys think about the sheer idea of a tax collector praying? Good on you, mate. That's how you should pray. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, you definitely are a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a Pharisee would have thought. Yeah. Do you think some of them might have thought he was even wasting his breath? Mm -hmm. Why would God listen to you? Mm -hmm. uh, there's all these sorts of things would be going on in the minds of the people that Jesus was telling this story to. Yeah, Pharisee's good. Tans Galeta, huh? Don't know why he's praying. Oh, yeah, you ought to pray like that. But you get that prayer. Now, what do we notice about the tax collector's prayer? What stands out to you? Brokenness. Yeah. He was a humble man. 
Be pride with humbleness. Right. So quite different to the Pharisee. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, very real. So what about his body language? What does that tell us? Where he stood, how he prayed? He didn't want any attention on himself when he was praying to the Lord because of him being a sinner, but rather be in the back. Yep. He, he, he was very genuine. Probably when you look at his actions, he was praying with his heart. Yeah. Yeah. You're real, like Lee said. Yep. So we've got these two prayers. And then Jesus comes out with that statement. And the version I've got, it says, I tell you, the tax collector went home accepted by God which I thought was a neat way of translating. I think a lot of the other visions have um, righteous before God or righteous with God in there. But he comes out with that statement that describes the situation. This guy went home righteous before God. This guy went home accepted by God. Now imagine how the people who were listening to Jesus felt when he said that. Here's the stats collector. Some people having trouble um, with their mics. Are you able to um, unmute yourself, guys? Um, so oh, was... oh, yeah. No, no, I could do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was trying. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, those, yeah, please, those who are actually unmuted, you can uh, unmute yourself when you're talking. And then when a speaker is speaking, you could actually mute it. So I just, um, yeah, yeah. Of, um, distracting. Okay. So how do you think the guys Jesus was talking to felt when he came out with the fact that the tax collector went home accepted by God, but not the Pharisee? What would they be thinking? They would be thinking that they would also be accepted in the, in the eyes of God. The, the way God looks at it is different than the way people look at them. All right. So, yeah, God saw things differently than they did. Yeah. Okay. Now, just an nice. interesting thought. If you'd been a tax collector hanging around while Jesus was telling this story, how would you feel? Yeah. Happy. Very pleased. Yeah. Yep. Whereas the Pharisee guys, the righteous guys, they would be sitting there going, oh, oh, I don't like this. Mm. Jesus, what are you saying? But that guy was doing the good stuff. Mm. See, this story tells us that we can never make ourselves good enough for God. Mm. And all of us need to be like that tax collector. Humble ourselves and ask for mercy. Okay, so looking at the story there, what particular thing stands out to you? God is not respectable of any man. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Others? What's the thing God's saying to you from that story? Actually, just to repent, and you don't have to say a long prayer. Repent and then a short and sweet prayer, and Jesus listens to you. Yep. Short, simple, real. It's your heart, uh, Brian. That God looks at. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Others? What stands out? I don't have to be perfect for God to love me. Yep. Too true. 
Okay. Now, that's the basic way we do the Bible study. Very simple, very oral, and designed for participation. So when you're doing that in person, obviously it's a lot easier than on Zoom, but you get people starting to talk. So you will have people who have never looked at the Bible before, ever in their lives, starting to get an understanding about Jesus and starting to say things. I remember uh, the second group that I started, in fact, it wasn't, I didn't start it. The first group actually organized the whole group and um, but wanted me to run it because the, the lady who did the organizing, I said, you should run it. And she said, Brian, it's my mother and my aunts and my, you know, that level, that generation. I'm not going to run it. I can't run it with them. So I did it. But I remember sitting there and I'd done slight, a different story when I first started the first one. And we'd finished and they were just sitting there afterwards. We'd stopped the meeting and they were all sitting around talking about Jesus. And I thought, how amazing this is. All I have to do is put the word of God in front of them and the spirit of God comes and he starts to work. And so you had this bunch of non-Christians who had for the first time looked at scripture and learned something about Jesus. And they were sitting there discussing him just between themselves. And I thought, wow, that is just so neat, so simple, but so powerful. Once we've done all this and we've done the story and we've done that, we then go to the next part of it. And it kind of goes like this. So I want you to listen carefully. If all this is true, what will you do? What are you going to change in your life this week in the way you think or speak or act? And who are you going to go and talk to about what you're learning and what you're going to do? So if all this is true, what will you do? Not looking for some great big, I'm going to change the world or transform my total life, but a very simple thing that you might be able to put in practice this week. So, folks, that's not a rhetorical question. What are you going to do? You've looked at the Word of God. You've studied the Word of God. Hopefully the Spirit of God has been speaking to you. What are you going to change this week in response to that? Probably I would uh, start uh, preparing myself how to tell the story and how to start the conversation. And because if who's Paris, that is for me, I have, that's what I look at it. Uh, given who is a parasite definition, who is a tax collector definition, and taking them through the story, I need to prepare myself with those explanations, with those simple words. I think that's what I would do in this week if I had to. Right. Yeah. Good. No, a nice, simple thing he's going to do. Next week when he comes back, he can tell us, if we're doing continuing meeting, he can tell us how he got on doing it, what happened. We could celebrate when he talks about what God did because he did that. Someone else? What are you going to do? You're muted now. Be more aware of um, uh, loving those that are um, unlovely, seeing them through God's eyes more. Right. Have you got anyone in particular in mind? No, not particularly. All right. So that, that one's going to be a bit harder, but in terms of making sure you can come back next week and tell people, hey, I did it. Yeah. But it's, it's something that's a good response to the story, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think I would, I would pray... And ask God to give me a person who would listen to my story 
And yeah. Yeah. the God will open their heart. And as you explain, maybe I would explain the same way as you explain here. And ask the same question to them. You know, what they feel. Sometimes, first changes must come in us. If there is any pride in us, must go. Yeah. Because yes. uh, as the word of God says, in, uh, as uh, Prakash said, God looks at the heart, definitely. Mm -hmm. If there are any weakness in us, must come out first. Then God would give us the opportunity to share his word to someone who really needs it. And God will open their heart to listen. So I would definitely first check myself. And yep. then I would pray to God to give me somebody whom I can share this story to. Where th that this story would be transformation in his life. Yep. I mean, a lot of us would have found when we're out sharing the good news, the people who go, oh, but I'm a good person. Mm, you know? You know, I give to charity, you know, I've, I've never murdered anybody. And, you know, they've got all these good things they do. And this is a good story to tell them. Mm. Yes. Because it brings out we can't make ourselves good enough for God. Mm. Mm -mm. So anyone else want to talk about what they're going to do? Yeah, we will be preaching from this story once again. We used to preach many times, but we couldn't go much deeper into it like today. And actually, the mercy of God is beyond everything, even our good activities, and even if we stay away from sin, but the mercy of God is great. That's what today we learn, because the sinner, he prayed, God have mercy upon me, and he was justified. Surely, in our fellowships, we have uh, fellowships many, so we'll be sharing this story with our evangelists and the believers. Thank you so much. Now, just, again, a training point. Some people say to me, in fact, I have one lady say, you can't ask people that question. What are they going to do? Who are they going to tell? And I looked at her and said, well, I've been doing it for six years. And one of the things I have found, I ask these questions of non-Christians right from the beginning when I start doing Bible studies with them. So I'm expecting non-Christians to hear the word of God and to respond to it practically in their lives. And the funny thing is, they're much better at it than Christians usually. Mm. I had one lady, real genuine lady, lovely lady, spiritful, out there doing stuff for God. And when we looked at one thing, she said, well, I'm going to make myself more available to God. And I said, okay, what is that going to look like? And she said, well, you know. And I said, no, I don't know. What's it going to look like in your life to make yourself more available to God? And she couldn't give me a practical action that she was going to do. Because so often as Christians, we've almost been trained to be waffly. It sounds spiritual to say I'm going to be more available to God. But to say I'm going to set the alarm 10 minutes earlier so they can actually have 10 more minutes praying to God, that's not how we think. We don't get practical and down to earth. So I actually am discipling non-Christians from the beginning to hear the word of God and put it into practice. And they will do it. They'll have their hassles doing it. And sometimes what they say they're going to do, I can't see how it connects with the story. And I, we, we looked one night at the story of the woman who wept at Jesus' feet. And one of the guys, when I said, so what are you going to do? You know, if all this is true, what will you do? And he went, well, I want to get rid of my ciggies. And I thought, how does your smoking fit in with the story? Get it? But if that's what God's talking to you about, we'll go with it. So he talked a bit about what he was going to do and how he was going to start getting rid of his cigarettes out of his life. If that's what God was talking to him about. That's it. Another guy once said to me, well, I want to change the way I speak. And I looked at him and I went, sorry, what do you mean? And he said, well, 
the way I'm talking to you, Brian, is not the way I normally talk. I'm normally very foul mouthed, and I want to change that. I went, wow, just these simple, practical, but life changing things they were talking about. So have high expectations. And when you have your group come back the next week, the first part of it is, how did you get on? You know, those things you said you were going to put in place, how did they work out in your life? You report, you celebrate. You know, someone says, um, you know, I'm going to learn up the definitions and I'm going to tell the people this story. How did you get on doing that? What happened when the people told? And you develop this whole ethos of let's report in and let's celebrate with each other about what we're doing and how God's changing our lives and what we see. I have one guy in a group, Zoom group like this, and he said, I want to report a failure. Now, his failure was this. He'd invited a couple around for dinner, non-Christian couple. He'd had another previous sort of dropped in at their place, and they knew he wanted to talk about God with them and everything, and they came for dinner. He said, but they just spent the whole time talking about themselves, their life, how hard their life had been, all the stuff that had happened in their life, etc. And I never got a chance or never made the chance to share the good news with them. So I failed. But everybody else in the group went, no, that's not a failure. Look, you invited them. They came. You've learned about them. You know more about them now. You know where to start when you do start sharing the gospel with them. And they all encouraged him on that. And that's what you look to build up a whole sense of encouragement. Someone had a really bad week, didn't do anything that they said they'd do, you pray for them and expect it to happen this week. So there's a real celebrate, encourage, reporting in type thing. Folk talk about accountability. Now, I've found a lot of people don't like that word, and it's not quite the ethos I want. It's not, well, did you do your homework? It's, hey, what happened in your life? What's God doing in your life? How did it work out? Oh, you did talk to your sister? What did she do? How did she respond? Oh, not that well. Never mind. You talked to her. Well done, etc. Oh, they responded. Don't they? they want to come to Bible study. Right. Okay. You know, that sort of ethos. So you get people to look forward to the week of what they're going to do. And when they come back, you look back and see how they got on and celebrate together. Then you go into the next story, repeat the process. So week by week, they are taking small steps to change their life according to what God has been saying to them out of the stories and just the way he's been touching their lives. Now, they might be small steps, but you imagine if you've got 40 or 50 small steps over a year. That's a big change in their life. So that now think, how much would it take for someone to be able to run a, a group like that? It's not a lot, is it? Not much. Not much. Learn up a story a bit. Hmm. Be able to read it. A note on the reading, first meeting together, I always read it myself. Second meeting, I will ask, does anyone want to read the story? I never ask someone to read because they may not be able to or they may not be very good at reading and they'll get embarrassed. So you always ask for volunteers. Now, once I've done a couple of times with non-Christians, I then ask them, do one of you want to tell the story next week? So I have non-Christians telling the story. I also get them to lead the first part and the how did we get on? And when you start going on, you get them to lead a bit of the, hey, what are we going to do part of it? So bit by bit, I actually get the non-Christians in the group to start leading parts of the group so that by the time we get to the end of seven stories, some of them have done every part of it. I normally leave getting them to do the question part further on, sort of three or four weeks in, because that's the hardest part to do. But what I'm doing is I'm discipling them from the start to be able to lead a Bible study, to be able to go to their friends, their relatives, their oikos, their family, their whanau, gather a group together and do what they've seen modelled in front of them. Now, doing this, normally, well, the earliest I've seen anyone get saved was week three. And depending on the order of the stories, week four, of sometimes depending on the group, week four I'll be doing the crucifixion and a number of people actually get saved. Or 
when we, if I put the crucifixion out to week six, they get saved then. They make that final decision through. But you can see them week by week. They are opening up to God. They are doing stuff. They are seeing God work in their lives. They are hearing the word of God. So it's just a progression right through. When they get saved, you don't have to do anything different. It just accelerates because the spirit of God's in their life now and it gets turbocharged. The changes happen a lot more and the openness to God's a lot more. But that's what I've seen happening. And with some groups that I've been doing this with, by the time I've finished in the seven weeks, they've already got another group started that one of them is leading. When I do it with Christians, my expectation is that at least one group will be started, if not two or three, because they should have a, a head start on the non-Christians and be able to do it. So that's what I'm looking at, and that's what I've seen. when it, With the first group I started this with in Mariwa, Amy, the lady who was with my person of peace into the group, said to me one day, Brian, will you come and join us for lunch at work? Now, they were a big pruning gang, pruning kiwi fruit. And I said, yeah, sure, and worked out where and when. And I figured I'm being set up for something here. You know, if they invite you along, there's a reason for doing it. So I went along and had lunch with them, got to meet them all, and I'm standing there leaning against this van that they arrived in, and this lady walks up and she leans next to me and she says, Brian, will you run a Bible study with me? And I said, yeah, sure, why? And she said, oh, well, Amy's been talking to me, talking about a lot of deep stuff, and I don't know anything about the Bible, and I want to. So will you run a Bible study with me? I've already organized so-and-so and so-and-so to do, do it with us. Now, how would you like that for a method of evangelism? Go out for lunch, lean against a van, and wait for them to come to you and say, can they do a Bible study? Now, it took them six weeks to put it together, but when we got it together, there was actually six non-Christians sitting in the room. Now, that's the sort of stuff I've been seeing, where disciples make disciples, groups form groups. So keeping it simple, keeping it based on the word, but just that bit of the word. I had one group. They were doing this, and they'd done it for three weeks, and the people that were coming were really good. And then it came up to Easter, so they thought, oh, we'll just do a thing different. They did this big study on the Passover and, you know, into the Old Testament, through into the New Testament meanings of it, all this sort of stuff. And then the next week they did a whole big study on the meaning of the crucifixion and everything like that. And the people said at the end of it, and back to me and said, Brian, what did we do wrong? What happened? And then I said, well, what did you do? And they explained how they'd had those two other studies. And I said, that's what you did wrong. You know, think of them in the first study. Were they with you? And they said, well, no, they did look a bit sort of lost and they did look a bit overwhelmed. Yes, yes. And they realized they'd hopped out and done a normal sort of full-scale Bible study and they'd lost non-Christian. They were left feeling, I can't keep up with this. I don't understand this. Hopping from one part of the Bible to the other, whatever. This is hard work. So they gave in. But if you stick with some same level ground there, they can all join in. They all participate. Their opinions valued. They feel valued. It's in terms of adult learning. It's the best way to do things, and so it works through. Keep it simple. I've got a series of stories I use for the sort of evangelistic part of it, and then we go into some discipleship stuff. A couple of lots there, story based, story based, right the way through. Now. What, what, are they, what are they, Brian? Can you say what you normally do for you? You do like seven stories, you say, for the evangelism side of it? Yep. Um, I can send anyone who wants the, the um, document that's got it all in. But basically, I start, okay. with, I start with Jesus picking up um, Andrew and Simon, James and John, going to the synagogue, casting out the demon, healing the mother-in-law and everybody that night. That's the first one. And that's so that they see Jesus as a man of action, a man with authority, which is quite different than the Jesus they've probably seen portrayed on the TV or wherever. Then we do the, um, the woman who wept at Jesus' feet. Basic deal there. If you're a sinner, who do you go to? Jesus. Religious dudes might look down on you. Jesus won't. And it's got that lovely line in there. Go in peace. Your faith has saved you. And that starts to bring out the whole area of faith. And, you know, hey, if you're a sinner, Jesus is the guy you go to. 
Then we do that story we've just done tonight, the Pharisee and the tax collector praying, and that's basically in there to show that we all need to ask God for mercy, not try and be good enough for him. Then, depending on where we go, we'll do Zacchaeus. And that's in there to give an example of repentance, a guy's life who totally changed. He was collecting money, he was very wealthy, and then he met Jesus and his life totally changed. In fact, he gave away his money, probably didn't have any left by the time he'd finished. And then we do um, the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus' daughter, and those are examples of faith, different ways that faith makes itself known, different things, but it's still having faith in God, you know, that statement Jesus made to Jairus, you know, don't be afraid, just believe. And we do that, and then we do the crucifixion and the resurrection. And like I say, sometimes crucifixion and resurrection, I do it um, week four and five. I have never yet managed to do a whole series right through without interruption. Doesn't matter who it is. And I'll tell you, the more dysfunctional the people you work with, the more dysfunction you'll get. You know, I got the phone calls with the first group, you know, oh, Brian, um, you better not come tonight. Um, the Rillies arrived and they're drunk. Wouldn't be worth it. You know, that sort of stuff was happening. No, I always went to them. And there's two reasons for that. One, because we're commanded to go, not sit and tell people to come to us. I'm not into an attractional model. And two, on their turf, they are more open and more comfortable. If they want to have a cigarette, they'll have a cigarette. Whereas at your place, they'll sit around feeling, oh, I wish we could have a fag, but they won't even ask. You know, if they want to have the beer while you're doing a Bible study, they'll have their beer. That's fine. You know, I just sit and away we go. Also, if you're there doing it in their home, you're going to meet the Fano. You're going to meet the people who come through. You'll meet the rest of the family. You'll meet things. You know, it's a whole different ball game if you do it in their space. Now, we've had some folk who don't want us in their house. Now, the reasons for that vary sometimes because it's an app mess and they don't want you to see that. Sometimes, in one case, it was because it was one of the drug dealing houses in the area and they didn't want us to sort of be there when the drug deals were going on. So we met in a third space, you know, down at the cafe, down at the park, wherever you go to another place and meet. Or if you're close and they'll do it, they can come to your place. But your place is the last resort. Don't do it in church. If you do it in a church building, the people think it has to be done in a church building. And that's not the case. If you do it in a home, they know it can be done in a home. So it reproduces. So we're looking at removing barriers to multiplication. And we're going to them. Now, like I say, I've seen this whole process repeat itself over and over and over again. Now, so another thing, um, I think, Brian, I was just sorry, to, um, was going to add doing it in their home is that more chances of getting their family members um, to join you with the study that we do um, yeah. than actually, because some of them are not comfortable. Yep, I've had the sort of scene where we're doing, we're in a lean to tapped on the side of a house, and we're at one end, and down at the other end is one of the cousins who have popped in, and she's sitting there by the door so she can have a smoke and blow the smoke out the doorway with her beer. And every so often I'd ask her a question in the distance. Hey, Burns, what about such and such? What do you think? You know, and she she was part of it, but not part of it. And you watch them sometimes, the body language is real classic. First meeting, they'll be over there in the distance. And the next one, they're a bit closer. And then the third one, they're actually sitting in the group. So they will come in. Sometimes you don't get them with that, with that very first group. First meeting, we had one bunch of folk. And I didn't know it, but the father in the household, there was Amy, the, my intro into the household. Her dad lived there. Her and her husband with their kids and assorted hangers on were around the place the hangers on changed but dad didn't appear in the first study he was actually sitting around the corner in his bedroom listening in because he wasn't sure about this parky high guy and what he'd be like or anything like that and he wasn't going to stick his head out and be part of any bible study or whatever but he really liked what he heard so next week i got to meet dad so yeah big advantages doing it at their place <coughs> so 
You do that stuff, you get there. Now, in the very last part of the group, if you've got time and it works out, it took me a while to get doing this, I often get them to try and tell the story to each other so they can practice. See while it's fresh in your mind. Can you tell the story to each other? You know, grab, grab another person and tell them the story and then repeat it that way. And do a little bit of practice stuff to try and build up skills. With a non-Christian group, because at the start of this, you don't have any how did you get on last week stuff, you've got time. And I actually sit and do the gospel presentation I use with them right up front as the first part of the meeting. And I had with one, one group, I did that. And when I got to them and said, you know, who are you going to talk to? The lady whose house it was in um, said, I'm going to talk to one of my carers. She had severe health problems and she had folk coming in who do her housekeeping and help her with sharing and all this sort of stuff. And she said, I'm going to tell one of my carers. And I thought the way she talked, she was just going to tell them that she was having a Bible study at her place. But no, nah, she gets her carer in. She sits her down and she starts to do the gospel presentation, talks about how we're all broken, and but God had a perfect plan for us and he, we would turned our backs on God and that's why we're broken. And she said, when I came to the bit about coming across to Jesus and what Jesus could do, I couldn't remember it all. So I, I went into my bedroom where I pinned up the piece of paper you drew the diagram on and I brought it out and I put it down and my ears are flapping. Now here's a non-Christian with a gospel diagram pinned on a bedroom wall. That shows you where she's at. And she plonked it down in front of her carer and explained the whole gospel to her. So I had a non-Christian doing a gospel presentation to another non-Christian. Now, how do you like that for a lazy way to do evangelism? You just get them to do it for you. So she did that. Now, when we got to week three, which was this story, she was the one telling the story. And so we did all this, and at the end of the story, um, and I'm actually full end of the meeting, her Christian friend, who was the one who organized the meeting, said to her, when you came to church, because you'd been a couple of times in the last two months, um, when you came to church, did you take communion? And she said, oh, no. And her friend said, why not? And she said, I didn't feel worthy. And I said, is that because of your Roman Catholic background? You know, you hadn't been to confession, you hadn't done it. She said, oh, a bit of that, but no, I just didn't feel worthy. And I said to her, do you want to know how to feel worthy? And she said, yes. And I just repeated the last line or almost the last line of that story. I just put my hand on my heart, my head down, and I went, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And I looked up and you could see the light turn on in her eyes because she knew the next line. That person went home accepted by God. Amen. And I said, yeah, that's how you get accepted by God. That's how you get worthy. God have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. And she just had this look and I said, do you want to do that now? And she said, yes. So you're prepared to do whatever Jesus wants for the rest of your life? Yes. Okay, welcome to the family. And away we went. So she told the story and ended up getting saved. I love that. Talks herself into the kingdom in some ways. But the word of God is powerful. And when you have non-Christians learning up a story, they're learning the word of God and it has a real effect on their lives. So that's the sort of stuff I've been doing and what I've been seeing. Questions? Oh, I can send to Pratish the material that I use for the, you know, the pages with those stories on it. I also have a very small or short leader's guide, nothing fancy, nice and simple that you can have. So I can send that out and he can email it out to anyone who wants it. Just let them know you want it. And then what do you do um, once you've led them to Christ, once you've gone through that, um, those first seven stories, are you okay, I've got, carrying on I've, with more Bible discovery, Bible, Bible study, are you forming yep. them into the church? What are you doing? Um, yes, yes, and yes to all of that. Basically, um, I've got four stories that I use next, which are basically designed um, to teach them that the basic deals we need to do is to love God, love people, make disciples, and then we do the prodigal son in there to show that God loves them. So those are the four things we cover off next. And then we go into another series of stories, which 
um, cover the sort of more normal things you'd expect to cover in a discipleship deal, you know, the word, prayer, you know, all that sort of stuff, the basics, but all based on stories. So I've got story sets to, to work with those. Normally by then, they're also in the Word of God themselves doing their own Bible studies. The lady who leaned against the van and wanted a Bible study, I felt when she got she got saved mm, week four, yeah, week four on the studies. And um, I didn't know at the time, but I found out a couple of months later that because at that stage, their pruning gang, it was a non-pruning time, so they were unemployed. She went down and stayed with Amy and her family for a couple of weeks. And I said, what was it like? And she said, oh, it was me. I said, oh, why? And she said, well, we'd get up in the morning and we'd get the kids fed and everything and off to school. And then it would go, time for a Bible study. So we'd sit down and we'd have a Bible study. And then we'd go and do a bit more housework and stuff like that and have lunch. And then it went, time for a Bible study. So we'd do another Bible study. And then we'd go and collect the kids from school and deal with them and have tea and all this. And after dinner, when the kids had gone to bed, it would go, time for another Bible study. They were doing three Bible studies a day. I have never had disciples with a hunger for the word of God like that. You know? That's what happens when you introduce them to the word of God in a way that they learn how to study and how to handle the word of God for themselves, just as part of the process. So, yeah, when I looked at that, I thought, wow. Okay. So when you send that, can you send us that, um, or Prakash, that um, list as, as well, what you, you know, where you go to from once they've, Things, yep. Things yep. I can send them all that. Mm, yeah. Just I've got few um, some of your email addresses, but I've just sent you my email address. So if you can forward me, so I can send the stuff to you guys. Those who haven't got my email address, and that'd be great. One of the things that I really love about the Discovery Bible Study, Brian, um, our family has been doing it. I know that we haven't seen um greater number of people doing it or but the excitement about it is that you know we see our six you know the younger one getting into the story i mean we had another family here that we've been praying and reaching out to and on a sunday morning we were looking after their children the sick family and their little boy i mean usually they don't let them hang around in anything church or anything like that but because it was such a relax atmosphere where stories been told even the kids getting into it and even this little boy was right into it i mean you know um, he's only i don't know how old uh, lee probably five years is it five, five five he was right into the story and he was getting things out of it i mean it's just amazing way i mean um it's totally a different ball game than preaching the message i know it has a place preaching uh from the pulpit we have long messages but this stuff is just you know, it's great stuff to see multiplication uh, and stories we all remember and the kids can remember stories so it's been interesting um brian yep yep i've had and one of the trainings we did down in westport we had a family actually come over to be part of the training and to help out a bit. And when we did a broke the training folk up into smaller groups and did DBSs with them, um, his five-year-old was part of it. And she was actually better than any of the adults in terms of what she came out with, I reckon. You know, that, that sort of uninhibited child thing. She saw something and she said something. You know, now five-year-old level, but amazingly profound. And you'll get that the whole way through. It's, I've had folk take this and use this approach in Sunday schools for normal churches. Um, a vineyard church down in Wellington, that's how they do their Sunday school. They do discovery Bible study approach with the kids at all ages. So it goes across all ages. I've done it with, you know, whole families, mum, dad. One that I did in my early days when I was sort of practicing with it was um, mum, a dad, a 17-year-old son who had just, dad was a bachelor and Christian, mum had been a youth group, but nothing ever happened. 
um, the son was just starting to come to our church's youth group and the daughter at 14 really uh, she was just along for the ride sort of thing and um, we did it and one of the things I asked folk to do if you can read and if you like to read read these first four chapters of Mark this week and then these five four chapters the next week sort of thing and and the second week when I came back in and they realized they hadn't done their reading and they wanted to. So they sat down over tea and did the reading furiously before I got there. So they decided in each subsequent week, they would read a chapter a night and talk about it in the family. And if there was any questions anyone had, they'd sort of bring them up and they'd discuss them as a family. And if they couldn't come to an answer, they'd write them down and ask me when I got there uh, that week. So this lot went from no connection with church or anything and to doing full-scale family devotional type thing within one week. And I thought, man, that's, that's really amazing stuff to have that happen. So stuff that can come out of it's really neat. Mm. Um, we've got about four minutes to go, Brian. We said 8.30, we will stop it because um, no. we know next time. I, we'd love to hear. I mean, it's great stuff, but um anybody has any questions or anything feel free to ask um for four minutes to go and we'll close the meeting i mean i can keep it going <laughs> but um probably come back again when will it be the next class um i will i will actually send a notification through email um I I don't like, you know, I'm a more personal touch person face to face, but since the Zoom is working, opening the door, especially Brother Lalan uh, from India, and um, um, I will notify you through email. Brother Brian, are you coming towards Oakland? Sorry, say again. Are you, are you coming towards Auckland anytime? Um, it all depends on your lockdown levels. I've actually scheduled at the moment to be doing a training in Pekaranga Baptist on October the 9th. I'm not oh, yeah. so sure that that's going to happen, but hopefully the levels will go down enough to make that worth doing. Um, oh, yeah. But, yep, I'm, I can, um, if you, my material I'll send out, there'll be a, a little email address on the bottom of it. So if you just contact me, if you've got stuff or you want me to sure. come up, we're in Caddy Caddy. So we're only sort of, depending which part of Auckland, an hour and a half, an hour and three quarters away from you. So that's not far. Oh, yeah. No, sure. Otherwise we come up to Caddy Caddy. Yeah, no, we're not in, we're not in Kiri Kiri now. We shifted down to Kitty Kitty. Kitty Kitty, not Kitty Kitty. Kitty Kitty. Kitty Kitty. We actually- yeah, no, I think- uh, if you uh, do happen to come to Papakura, we're not too far away from my church. Actually, it's not too far away from there. So I could get all my leaders and people together for training if uh, yep. that's an option. Yep. Not a problem. We could even uh, rope in Pastor Pukash. Yep. <laughs> we um, Basically, we, we go wherever people want training. The, the day-long one we do, we do basically just simple evangelism tools and we do one discovery bible study so people get a, a taste of what it's like etc and then we go from there with those who want to do more after that mm. but um, one of the things I've, I've seen over the last few months since i've been doing a lot of this stuff around the churches is the the real desire of christians to be equipped to be able to share the good news in a way that works right in a way that's natural and a lot of them go, you know, pastors tell us to do it, but they don't tell us how. And I want to know how to do it in a nice, simple way. And, um, yeah, we get a lot of good stories coming back from people there, how they've started going out, how they're seeing stuff happen, and a pretty simple, effective tools. So, yep, yeah, but we are around. Um, our next planned trip takes us to Napier, then across to Waikanae, up to Levin, and up to Wanganui, and then back home again here to Caddy Caddy. Um, that's at the end of October. We start that one down to Napier on the 30th. Um, doing that, that'll take um, two weekends to do all of that. And um, we've got the one in the Baptist Church in Pakaranga. And what else? Well, we've got another one somewhere. 
every weekend in October is book bar one, I think now. Um, I but, could get yeah. uh, Brian your email address to Pastor Joel, and um, then he can connect with you. Yep, yep. It'll be on the material I send, so that's easy awesome. to find. Hey, it's eight thirty, right on eight thirty. So, right. <laughs> so, th thank you so much, um, Brian. That was wonderful. And everybody, thanks for joining. Um, I hope you are all blessed, and we shall catch up again next time. Thank you. Thanks thank very you. much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome, folks. Bless you. Bye. God bless you all. Bye. Thank you God for bless all of you. Bye, Prakash. Bye. God bless, guys.